Well, Megan, I've been wearing Vionic shoes for over three years now, but this month, my trusted shoe brand and I entered a new phase of our relationship, international travel. Well, Sarah, that is a serious commitment, (laughs) right? You can't just pack any shoe for a trip abroad. It's got to be stylish enough for those major cosmopolitan cities. It's got to be sturdy enough for trains, planes, buses, and city streets. And obviously, it's got to be comfortable enough to support your feet over many, many miles of walking. Well, no surprise, my Vionics were up to the task. I had two pair with me, a pair of casual sneakers in a cool gray color, and then a weatherproof suede ankle boot that I swear still looks brand new after 10 days on soggy sidewalks. Megan, the only time my feet hurt the entire trip was New Year's Eve when I made the mistake of wearing a pair of booties not from Vionic. So I'll just leave that data right here for you. Okay, well, that's pretty conclusive, Sarah. Vionic has the best curated styles to get you ready for whatever 2024 has in store, whether it's jet setting like Sarah or keeping up with busy mom life on this side of the pond. They even offer a 30 day guarantee, wear them, love them or return them for a full refund within 30 days. And we've got a great deal for you. Use code the mom hour 15 at checkout for 15% off your entire order at vionicshoes.com when you log into your account. That's a one time use only. Bionic Shoes, wearable well-being for your feet. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Megan. We're two moms with eight kids between us, from little to grown. We're in different areas of the country and in different stages of life. But we both know that motherhood's a lot easier when real moms share tips and encouragement. And remind you that it's really all going to be okay. We're not experts. We're parents who've been there. We're not perfect. We're real. Welcome to the Mom Hour. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 236 of the Mom Hour. I'm Sarah Powers here, as always, with Megan Francis. Hey, Megan. Hey, Sarah. How you doing? I am great. It is a rainy day here in California. What's your weather like? It's about, um, it's actually nice for this time of year. It's like 45 degrees maybe, and just neither really cloudy nor really sunny. Just november I'll take it. Just kind of november yep. Okay, well, this is funny because longtime listeners, you know, we used to always talk about the weather when we started the show until we did our first listener survey. And you all were very kindly like, hey, guys, maybe we don't care. (laughs) Maybe not every time, especially because the show airs like on a completely different day than we record. Right. But it is kind of appropriate today because once a quarter or so, you all give us permission and we indulge in just like a catch up chit chat. What's going on in our lives? what's going on with the kids, maybe some travel, maybe some business updates. Um, I think, Megan, as the show's progressed, we try to keep our Tuesday episodes pretty focused. We've got stuff, yeah. to, we've got stuff to tell you all out there. We got to get to it. Yeah. So sometimes we never get around to talking about just stuff, right. you know, so right. this is a good opportunity to do that. So we are going to do that for the first half of the show today. We have some um, some fun business updates for you all. We have a little travel update. We went to Nashville together. We're going to talk a little bit about our Thanksgiving plans. So a grab bag from Sarah and Megan at the top of the show. And then Katie joins me in the second half of the show to talk about reading while traveling, reading to your kids, what kind of books we like to read when we're traveling. And we also have a couple of holiday book recommendations and an update on what she and I have been reading lately. So Sarah, you know, when someone's trying to sell me something, I can be pretty skeptical. Maybe it's my rebel tendencies. But having some healthy doubts has definitely kept me from wasting money on every cool product the algorithm sends my way. You know what's not too good to be true, though? Our sponsor, Ritual, and their clinically backed Essential for Women 18 Plus multivitamin. Yeah, Megan, that's so true. We both love these vitamins because they're made with high quality and traceable key ingredients in clean bioavailable forms. And they're gentle on an empty stomach with a fresh minty essence in every bottle. So you don't have to worry about nausea if you're a bit relaxed about when you take them. I'm also a big fan of Ritual's sustainability standards. They use scientific tools to select lower carbon packaging, prioritize sustainably sourced ingredients, and set ambitious climate goals. No more shady business. Ritual's Essential for Women 18 Plus is a multivitamin you can actually trust. Get 20% off your first month for a limited time at ritual.com slash the mom hour. Start ritual or add essential for women 18 plus to your subscription today. That's ritual.com slash the mom hour for 20% off. We are welcoming a new sponsor today, Dr. Mom Butt Balm. Sarah, this might sound a little weird, but when my kids were babies, I actually really enjoyed changing diapers. It felt like a little time out to connect. Oh, yeah, Megan, I can totally remember that feeling of just kind of leaning in and enjoying a little moment in your routine. 
Yeah, but when my babies had diaper rash, it made the whole experience so much less fun for both of us. And back in those days, we didn't have great options for rash cream either. It was usually goopy, heavy, and full of dyes and preservatives and other things I didn't really want to put on my baby's butt. Well, the creator of Dr. Mom Butt Balm, who is a mom and also a doctor, had the same experience, Megan, and she did something about it. Dr. Mom Butt Balm is free of dyes, preservatives, and zinc oxide. It's easy to apply, easy to remove, and you don't have to use a lot to protect your baby's skin. I really love the way this balm feels. It's almost like a high-end skin cream. Very nice, no strong scent, and definitely nothing like the diaper rash creams I used to struggle with. Don't let diaper rash come between you and your baby. Shop for Dr. Mom Butt Balm online at Amazon or Walmart today. Well, Megan, before we dive in, I feel we should give a little shout out and a welcome to new listeners. If this is your very first time listening to us, welcome. Or maybe you've checked out one or two episodes and we're still growing on you. <laughs> yes, we've heard that that's a thing. Um, also, where are all you coming from? There's just a sudden like surge in new listeners, which makes me very excited. Yeah, it's funny. We had a couple of uh, reviews in Apple Podcasts, which we so appreciate. And they were really kind reviews. And they both said that it took a couple of episodes to get into us. And I just want to say I sympathize with that. One of the challenges for us, we've been doing this almost five years, is we feel like there's like an inner circle of our longtime listeners and those of you who know us really well. And of course, we know each other really well, but we never want that to feel like, you know, last week when we met Megan, when we talked about like conversation, awkward conversations where you come in and you're the only one yes. who doesn't yes. know what's going on. So we never want new listeners to feel like that. And I would say we have some great um, resources on our website for new listeners for to kind of like get to know us and some episode recommendations by stage of life and all that. So if it's your first time, first of all, this is going to be fun because it's a little bit of like a grab bag. You'll hear a little bit of everything. But also don't give up. Head to the <laughs> Um Check give out the archives. Give us a chance. <laughs> give, us a, give us a chance. And yeah, shoot us an email. Tell us where you're listening from or how you found the show. We're hello at the momhour.com. We make an effort to reply to every single email, even if it takes a few weeks. Um, and we love, love, love hearing from new listeners. So I really do just wanted to give an official welcome. OK, well, it is Thanksgiving week. It is. What are you up to this? Oh, week? my gosh. Well, um, the first half of the week is just like normal. Just that usually is the case for me. My kids um, will have, you know, school Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday. Do they have a half day then Wednesday or anything? They do have a half day Wednesday, which I forgot until you just said that. <laughs> I literally forgot that that was a thing. In fact, I'm not even 100% sure it is a thing, but it's always been a thing before. So mm -hmm. I'm going to go with yes. OK. Um, and then this is the first year. Um, so this will be my fourth holiday separated, my third divorce, which is kind of crazy, okay. actually. Um, but every year up until this year, we've done Thanksgiving. The kids, dad, and John and I have done Thanksgiving all together. And this year... Um, and it, it needed to happen at some point. We're going to, um, swap Easter and Thanksgiving. So I get Thanksgiving this year. Thankfully, I didn't want to be the one to start not having the holiday. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I don't know, like we're still kind of nailing our plans down. I don't, I don't love the idea of like going to somebody else's family Thanksgiving. Like that kind of depresses me. So honestly. right now it just for everybody, it's you and the five kids, just it's the me six and the of five you. kids. Okay. Yep. Just the six of us. I think what we'll probably do um, and we're still, you know, we're recording this about a week ahead, ahead of time. So we'll probably do dinner at home with just the six of us and then go to my sister's in the evening when they're done with their holiday dinner. And do you and like then, a midday meal or? A yeah, we usually, and honestly, we usually do like our Thanksgiving dinner is almost always like two o'clock okay. in the afternoon. That's just historically the way it's been. Um, or at least the party gets started around two, like yeah. maybe snacks are out at two and then dinner gets served at like four and then everyone's recovering in front of the TV by like six. So, um, this year, and we always do some part of the holiday with my sisters. We always do like, you know, Friday night at her house or mm -hmm. Saturday night at her house. And I think probably this year we'll just move it up and do Thursday and Friday at nice. her house. And the kids always look forward to that. It's always a fun favorite time of year for all of us. And um, yeah, I'm excited about that. So how about you? I know you've got a big week planned. Oh, yes, we do. So my kids, first of all, here in Southern California, it's becoming more and more common and maybe around the country to have the whole week off of school of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off. I have mixed feelings about this. It was not like this when I was growing up in um, California schools. It was not like this in Arizona because Arizona had a fall break that was a couple weeks earlier in October. Um, I, I don't know how I feel about it. It feels like so close to winter break to have a whole week off. It's very challenging mm. for working parents who only get Thursday, Friday off. Um, I guess it provides some flexibility for travel. 
And, you know, we've made use of that the last couple of years. So that's fine. So the kids have the whole week off. We, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, so this is, will have already, this will have already happened. We are going up to Portland, Oregon for Brian's grandma's 90th birthday. Mm. And it is a family gathering. So it will be like its own, almost its own Thanksgiving. I think we are going out to a casual dinner. There was talk of actually doing a Thanksgiving dinner on the Sunday. Now, this is the Sunday that has already passed in real life when you're listening to this. Um, (laughs) Again, it's the time warp thing. It becomes very confusing. Um, But I think we are going out instead and back to Brian's grandma's for dessert. Um, She's a very spry little healthy 90 year old. Lots to celebrate. I have mixed feelings about doing this extra travel. It feels in my brain in real time, Sarah, where I still have to pack and do laundry for this trip. It feels like a lot, but I know we will be glad to have seen that side of the family. And then we come back and we'll go right to Santa Barbara um, and spend the rest of the week at my parents and do Thanksgiving there. And the actual group for Thanksgiving, my brother will be in town. My sister and her little family will not be, they'll come for Christmas, but not Thanksgiving. Um, And then my aunt, uncle and two grown cousins. So grown, not as grown up as me. These are the cousins that were little when I was a teenager. So I'm much Mm -hmm. older than most of my cousins. So they are like young men, like, like Jacob. Girl. and Isaac, Yeah, no, a little bit older than Jacob. And then like Isaac's age. Um, and so I think that will be really fun because one's in college, one's out of college. And my kids aren't used to being around this like middle generation. Do you know right. what I mean? Like young yeah. adult and they're sweet, sweet boys. And I love my aunt and uncle. And so they are coming down from Oregon to spend the week with my family. And I think that will be, it'll make it feel like a, like a bigger group. And I always like a bigger group for Thanksgiving. I remember when I was growing up. So all the, I was one of the older cousins on my mom's side because I was the youngest of the oldest family. Uh-huh. That makes sense. Yep. Um, and then on my dad's side, I was the very, very youngest. I was the baby, baby, baby. Mm-hmm. And there were cousins who were like 25 years older than yeah. me on that side. So I always loved when it wasn't very often that we got to see the older because the older ones have lives. They're right. out doing stuff. Um, but I remember that being very special. Like when I would get to spend time with my, you know, when I was like 10 to get to spend time with like my 20 year old cousin. I always felt so cool. Yeah. And this is like, yeah, it truly is like a middle generation. So between me and my kids, these two boys, I was 20 when the youngest cousin on this side was born. So I'm 20 years older. So yeah, he's like 19 and his brother's like 23 or 24. Mm -hmm. Um, So for my kids, those will be like these, you know, young adults. And for me, it's the, you know, the cousins who are no longer little boys. So right. that's That's so fun. Well, we mentioned weather at the top of yeah. the show. I would just like to state for the record that if you're a Florida, Texas, Southern California, Arizona person, hopefully you are rejoicing like me because we it finally <laughs> looks like November. We had it was so hot. We it's it's common for us to have a hot autumn, um, but we got a break the last couple of years. This was horrible. I'm talking 90s in November, high 80s in November, and. Um, fire danger. It's just no good. So it's drippy, rainy and dark outside right now. And it's glorious. And I know the same weather would not make you so happy. So what's it been like for you? (laughs) Well, it's been very typical November, which is to say all over in Michigan, which is to say all over the place. Um, We've already had a snow day. It's so funny. First of all, every year we have a November snow day. I can't think of a year we haven't, but every year it takes us by surprise. Like every year someone's going, well, I can't believe it's a snow day already. And then I'm thinking literally on this exact same day, like two years ago, there was a snow day because it came up on my Facebook yeah. memories. <laughs> and I honestly think it's the kind of, it's usually the kind of weather that were it February or January probably wouldn't be a snow day. Um, they probably wouldn't cancel school because by that point we've used up so many, mm-hmm. but it always, it's like we always kind of aggressively come in with that first one. It's like the first time we get snowed on, everyone forgets yeah. that this happens every year. So Um, we've had a fair amount of that, but it's all melted now. I mean, we won't probably have any sticking snow until around Christmas, sometimes even later. Um, it's just been kind of chilly and and gray and yucky. And so it's nice to have a day that where at least I could go outside without mittens, you know, it's like, and go walk the dog and not be miserable the whole time. Yeah. Um, so another thing that's always interesting about this time of year is often it starts to snow before all the leaves fall. Oh, so you have like, several batches of leaves falling and we had the first one and those were all the dry, crunchy, beautiful ones that everyone loves like yeah. around Halloween. And we skipped in them and then <laughs> eventually raked Instagrammed them. Instagrammed it. Yep. Instagrammed it. And then the snow caught. Well, then there's like the rain leaves. There's like the day you'll have like the big rainstorm and it's super windy and a bunch of leaves. So then you've got nasty, wet, rotting leaves Ooh. that I'm allergic to. So this time oh. of year, I am super sneezy. I think it's the rotting or the mold, whatever uh-huh. it is. And then we have the post snow leaves or the leaves on top of snow. So last year when it, or last week when it snowed, 
it also then got very windy and all the rest of the leaves came down on top of the snow and then the snow melted and now there's just like a big sloppy pile. So we're dealing with a lot of leaves and I, I was curious, you, I mean, you don't really have seasons the way we do, but are leaves ever a thing? Do they ever fall off trees? It sounds like such a stupid question. No, they do. And I think the difference, and I can't speak for the entire state of California because obviously we have, we're big You're and there's the many southern, landscapes. Yeah. Um, I'm Southern and I'm near the coast. I think one thing I noticed is we just have a wide variety of vegetation. So it's not all one or two kinds of leaves. So some trees yeah. drop their leaves. A lot of them don't even start dropping till around now, November, December. We have these big sycamore they drop these giant leaves. They look like a maple leaf, only they're the size of a dinner plate. And they don't okay. they don't turn pretty colors is the bummer. They, so we do like I can walk outside and there are these leaves on the ground. And some people have a maple or um, it's another one, not the kind of oak that I grew up with, but maybe a different kind of oak tree that drops its leaf. So you'll go outside and there's some leaves on the ground. Um, our, where I live, the yards are very small. So we don't tend to have a lot in our own yards. Most people don't have like a big tree in their yard. Yeah. We just are on small pieces of property. But there would be um, like community association, like HOA will do some leaf cleanup. And so we don't have to do it. But you do see people nice. scooping some leaves. I just think it's, it's more spread out. It's a fewer percentage of the actual trees. And then we don't have what you're talking about, which is lots of rain, snow and wind to like further the mess. Well, and I, I'm sure there's a reason not to do this. But I last year never got around to raking the backyard all the way. And by the time the snow melted in the spring, it had basically all just turned into like mulch. I mean, yeah. it was like all just in the ground. It was no problem. The front yard, you kind of have to, otherwise it blows into other people's yards. So you can't really <laughs> just like leave that. And here, what you do is you just, you just rake it right into the gutter and okay. they come through and pick it up. Oh, okay. But that means also that, you know, until they get around to it, every time I drive down an inner, the, the big streets, they don't do that. You have to bag them. But if you're on one of the side streets, anytime I'm walking or I'm driving side streets, I'm terrified because I think there's like children or pets in these piles of leaves. Like, there's huge piles wow. of leaves everywhere. And it's just like, my, I have this paranoia that a little kid's going to pop out of one. Yeah. You know, and they're so, like in the gut, they're like in the street, basically. They're like in the street. Oh yeah. yeah. That would be, that would make me nervous. Yeah. Too. And if they're very big, they go pretty far out in the street. So I right. basically drive down the middle of the road. <laughs> just in case. For the season. Just, in, just case in case there's like a little kitten in that pile of leaves. Exactly. Oh that would gosh. be too bad. So funny. Yeah. Well, we had some really cold weather in Nashville. Uh, that was a shock to my system. So right when we went to the Blistem conference um, in Nashville, it was right at the tail end of that super freeze that you all in the Northeast and the Midwest where temperatures were like crazy, crazy cold. And even though Nashville's a little bit further south, it was, I don't know, 20s at night and 30s when we got there. And, um, yeah. and then it warmed up while we were there. So I can't say that made me very happy. I think I just assumed it would be a little bit warmer than Michigan and it wasn't much. Yeah. Know, five, 10 degrees. Yeah. yeah. The second day we walked. So, okay. So backing up, we were speaking at Blistem. Um, we spoke, uh, we did a course on, or a workshop on, um, monetizing your podcast, making money from your podcast, um, which thankfully we are in a position to talk about and we feel very grateful for that. And, um, we had good a good audience and good questions. And we met some awesome people. Um, and then we also got to actually see Nashville very briefly. Now you talk about how you've known Nashville for a long time. And I was a first timer. Yeah. So I, li I lived out there briefly twice. I lived out there for about four months between my first and second years of college. My brothers lived in a town called Murfreesboro, which is, I don't know, 45 minutes away or something like that on this long country road in the middle of nowhere. Um, and I actually worked in Nashville. I worked for a company that did a uh, home shopping network, but on VHS tapes. Oh my God. So I don't know what happened to the company, but I don't think they would have made it very long after that anyway, because I don't think people use VHS very much longer. And I also used it or worked at Opryland, the amusement park, which is no longer there. The still, the rest of it's still there. Like Opryland as a concept is still mm -hmm. there. The grand old Opry is there. But the amusement park is no longer there. But okay. that was um, an interesting job. And then moved back there when I was pregnant with Jacob. Um, John and I lived down there for a little while. We lived with my brother. And then we had our own place. And then Jacob was born in Nashville. And we lived down there till he was probably five or six months old. And then moved back to uh, Michigan. I really like it down there. And I've been back a couple of times for com um, for conferences and things. But it's been a while since I've like gone out and done stuff and we got to go out like uh, to music row. Which yeah. Was cool. Yeah. And I'm glad that we did that. I was sort of had this like looming sense of dread that I was going to tell people around here. I was going to Nashville, which people think is like 
they think it's cooler than Vegas because Vegas is so close to us. Like people are right. like, oh my gosh, you're going to Nashville. And then they want to tell you their favorite places. And I just had this feeling like I'm going to come home and I have spent the entire time in a conference hotel, which sometimes happens to us <laughs> at happen. these things. And so I was like, okay, this can't happen. We have a very sweet listener named Nora Jane Struthers, who's a singer songwriter and offered to take us to her favorite honky tonk. And we had lunch and listened to her friend play. So I just felt like, okay, I have to come back and do this more, but at least I can say I did the thing you're supposed to do. Just go hear live music and, you know, see music grow. So that was really great. We also had, um, a listener recognized us on the street, which is like that was amazing. my favorite thing ever. Lizzie, cutest pregnant mama, about to have baby number two. Um, we talked about C-sections, second time C-sections. We like accosted her on the street and like met her husband and made him take a picture. And it was made our night. So thank you, Lizzie. It was great. And, and I really loved that. I assumed she knew us from the conference because we were right outside the conference hotel. And she's right. like, Sarah and Megan, and we're like, Yes. Yeah, <laughs> she was not out. she's a Nashville local and they were yeah. I do think she must have seen on Instagram that we were at the conference, maybe giving yeah. her a little more confidence that like, yes, that in was, fact, that was is just us. two random people in Nashville who look like them. <laughs> in my yeah. in my oversized old man coat and funny right. hat. It's, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. We also got to hang out with Casey Clifford, who was on the show. How many how long ago was I that? I think that was Mm, June is what comes to my June. mind. I okay. could be wrong. Yeah, that sounds about right to me too. So she she did an episode with us, um, a Voices episode with you mm-hmm. back in June and she was at the conference and we hosted a little podcaster get together in our room. And we like, it was very crowded because our room was just a regular room and we had like 11 or 12 people besides us in there or something like that. So that was really fun. It was, it was really fun. Um, a lot of times these conferences have podcast like tracks or podcast mm-hmm. workshops, but still, if you're a podcaster, you're in the minority tend to be. So it's fun to have like to band together and chat with others. We saw Sarah and Beth from Pantsuit Politics and um, Jamie from the podcast and a whole bunch of really fun people met some new podcasters new to us and also new to podcasting. So that was really fun. But Megan, one of my highlights of the entire Nashville trip was using your blow dryer hairbrush thing that you've talked about on the podcast before. But here's what's so funny. Two days ago, we aired a More Than Mom all about our hair routine, but that was recorded before we went to Nashville. So I feel like a journalistic obligation <laughs> to update. To come back, tell the story. So you have to say what it is. It's a, it's the Revlon. It's the Revlon, like, all-in-one. Gosh, I always forget that. It's kind of a long name. We'll link hair, it up. We'll link it yeah, up. Yeah, like, a, it's called, like, the Revlon all-in-one um, hair styler or something like that. And it's, it's basically, it looks like a medieval torture device. <laughs> it was way bigger than I imagined. <laughs> um, it's like a round brush, but like a big round brush with um, with a hairdryer built in. And the hairdryer, it, they have these in the, in the 70s and 80s. This is not a new concept, but they used to be very small. Like I remember my mom had one. My mother-in-law had one. They're like kind of wimpy and small. This is big and it blows, it's hot and it blows really hard. So it's straight, it basically not always completely straightens, but smooths your hair very quickly and the, dries it at the same time. Yeah. In the same way that you would use a blow dryer and a round brush, which if you were able to do with both at once, which well, I am not. Yeah. And if you listened on Sunday, I, you heard me say that I will do anything to avoid blow drying my hair. I'll let it air yeah. dry and then straighten it. I'll do all these other things. So this was amazing. I'm going to order one probably today. I'm not even going to wait till Christmas. We will link it up in the show notes. And there's no, I have nothing else to say, except it I was, was I loved it because I came back from having breakfast and <laughs> I walk in and there you are. I was someplace and I walk in and you're like, I love it. Your hair was so smooth. I know. And great. you know, I still ran the flat iron over it sure. on the top, but like the, the net amount of time was the same. And uh, my hair also stayed looking really good for like three days. And we yeah. all know that second and third day hair um is like the telltale so it was yes. great loved it well I'm glad you gave it a whirl and right. I took it with me it did um, take up a lot of room in my suitcase so <laughs> yeah it is no like it's funny because no I think joke. I'd seen a picture of it online and size is different just like when you meet someone in person that you've never met online they're always exactly. taller or shorter than you think this thing it was like 50% bigger than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah, it's it's impressive. Well, you've had something else going on that's that you are, I guess, now able to announce. I am ready to announce. Okay. okay. So many, many, many months ago, you might have heard, might have heard us talk about, um, I am launching a podcast with my oldest child, my 11-year-old middle schooler called Kid Literate. It's a podcast about books and shows and movies and music and podcasts that we listen to as a family. I would say it's a show for kids and parents together. It's not specifically for kids, but I picture kids enjoying listening 
together with mom or mom listening to get ideas for the kids, etc. So everyone's welcome. Everyone's included. It is called Kid Literate. It launched yesterday with three episodes. Um, Amazing. I just have to like get kind of personal for a second here and say like I've had over the time we've been developing this, I've definitely had times where I've thought, I don't know how I feel about putting my middle schooler out there for her own. Like, what if we get a iTunes review that's not very nice or like what? It's just it's a different can of worms to do something like this with your own child, both for her and my relationship and also her relationship with the public at large. And I I say that not to like I've already made my peace with it. Obviously, I've decided to do it, but it has felt very different than anything else we've ever done. And I'm really excited about it. She is at an age where she still thinks it's cool to sit down and record a podcast with her mom. And so yeah. I think that's awesome. I love talking about media for kids, me personally. So that's really fun. Um, and I have no idea how many of our mom hour listeners will hop over and listen or if we'll maybe get um, some listenership from outside the show. So I don't know, Megan, it is a little bit, it's a little bit scary to do these new things. Um, it I, is. I yeah. But I'm excited because well. I've been waiting for this one for a while yes. and I think it's going to be fine. Like if it turns out that it's an issue, you, I'm sure you can find some way to shield her yes. from that. You know what I mean? And I don't think we've in all the years we've been getting, you know, iTunes reviews. I think we've gotten one that was mean. Yeah. And it was like a week after we launched and someone yeah. said, we, we do drone on. I'll never forget it. <laughs> oh, it we said, do. They do. They drone on and on. That was like, it was like our second review. And I thought, oh, well, he's probably right. I don't know why I think it's a guy, but I just thought it was a guy. <laughs> they do. It was we like, do. he's probably right. We do. We, we, drone, do we drone, drone on and on. Well, um, um, if you guys want to check out Kid Literate, I would be so flattered. And we will link up in the show notes or you should be able to search Kid Literate, all one word, wherever you get your podcasts. Obviously, you know the drill. Ratings, reviews, um, and subscribing really helps a brand new show. And um, so I personally appreciate all of that. We will keep you posted as more episodes roll out. I'm calling this kind of a soft launch, but I guess it's not soft anymore because I've just, uh, I've just. If you announce it, it's it hard. Here. It's a hard it's launch. Here. Yep. It's happening. Um, and that brings us to our other new show that we've been developing, Megan. So how about an yes. update? We've got a lot of questions about this. So about, oh my gosh, last spring we put, oh, actually it was around this time last year that we put out a call for talent for um, a show we were casting called Expecting. And then it took us till about March or April to actually get it together enough to cast the show and then actually start recording. And man, this has been a lot harder <laughs> than I expected uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Um, it's a narrative style show. We brought on six pregnant panelists. Um, and I am kind of like weaving their stories together with my own sort of scripted narrative. And it's just completely different than anything we've done before. Nothing like us just kind of riffing here, right? Yeah. It's much more sort of public radio style, I guess. Um, and so, but but kind of done in a more homespun way. I mean, it's definitely gonna be accessible, um, easy to listen to, fun, and all that. But it's like we're trying now realizing with all the time that we've put into it, we've got a pilot ready to go, but I feel like what needs to happen next is not just to throw it out there, but to kind of know what we're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. So because not just for me and all the work that I put in and Brian, our sound engineer, and then Sarah, you setting up the website and all that, but like, um, also just for the panelists, like I want the show to go someplace. Mm -hmm. And so these six women like really let us into their lives and, so we want to have a good plan for that. So we're kind of exploring some different ways to get it out there. Maybe some ways to partner. Um, maybe going to send it to some, I mean, maybe I'll just do something crazy and send it to a big network or something. We'll see. I don't know. So in case you don't know how production works on something like this, like these six women, um, we have a ton of raw audio already. They followed yes. their pregnancies through, you know, at least the second half of their pregnancies. Their, their stories have been recorded. All of their babies have been born. So like, it happened. It's just now about putting it all together, like you said, and right. doing something with it that's worthy of those stories. So exactly. Yeah. The assembly is the heart. Yeah, we've gotten yeah. all we got all the stories, all the raw audio is there. Um, now it's just assembling it in the best way. So my aim is to have it fully launched for you to listen to all of you people who in, are interested um, in early 2020. And we will keep you up to date. I love that. Well, we have been getting lots of questions about expecting. We've also gotten lots of People telling us they're pregnant and they're ready to be in season two. And we're like, <laughs> yeah, we're like oh, shoot. so sweet let's of you. Get season one done first. <laughs> I can't even think about season two right now. But once, you know, it's one of those things, like once you learn how to do something, it gets easier the second time. Yeah. 
but like I've been in this learning, like hardcore learning curve for a few months now. It's so, good for yeah. us. It's good for it us to try new us. things. Yep. Okay. Well, this has been really fun. It's really fun to catch up this way. And listeners, thank you for, um, we've heard from several of you who said that you just enjoy when we come on and chat for a while. It doesn't always have to be like 20 tips to solve the problems of your mom life. So that actually makes it really fun for us. And Perfect for Thanksgiving to do something like this. Yeah, I'm really sorry we didn't uh, solve anyone's mom life this week, but there's always (laughs) next Tuesday for that, right? Um, We also wanted to let everyone know about our second three-part series. So we did one last week about creating holiday memories. And then we're going to do another one this week, dropping Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We know that a lot of you are going to be hanging out in the kitchen, cooking or traveling, or maybe just vegging out in your room by yourself, avoiding the family or something. (laughs) So it's a three-part series about holiday shopping. Um, And we're going to cover everything from planning your shopping to buying, storing and wrapping the gifts and also why we like to shop small and how we actually go about buying from makers and handmade gifts from artisans and things like that. So make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss them. They are going to drop in your feed Wednesday, Thursday and Friday of this week. Yes, it's going to be really fun. And our thinking of doing it this week was a lot of you do like to start your shopping Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and this way they're just in your feed. So you can tuck them away if you're busy traveling or use them as your uh, travel companion while you're getting to your Thanksgiving dinner. Sarah, when my kids were little, I was always pretty torn on whether to give them a daily multivitamin. I knew that modern kids' diets have some pretty big nutritional gaps, but I also knew that most children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise. They're filled with sugar. They have all kinds of chemicals and preservatives in them. And I was like, why would I give these to my kids? Luckily, two dads recognized the problem and came up with a solution. Haya, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. Your first shipment comes with a cute bottle that has fun stickers your kids can use to decorate it too. My kids always loved that. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, go to HayaHealth.com slash MomHour. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash MomHour and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. I'm here with Katie Addis, and this is Sarah Powers again. Hey, Katie. Hey, Sarah. So for those who are just joining us for the first time, Katie is our in-house books uh, expert or correspondent. (laughs) Correspondent. (laughs) Katie comes over to my house in real life every couple of months and we sit at my kitchen table and talk about kids books or grown-up books and what we're reading lately. Um, And we are headed into the holiday season and we're wrapping up almost the full calendar year of doing this. We actually started doing this like holiday season last year. So it's been um, over a year. A full year of segments. Yeah of this type of thing. Katie is a mom of um, a toddler and a preschooler, two preschoolers, Mm -hmm. really. How how old is everybody right now in time? Three and almost five. Okay. Oh my gosh. Yeah. As a refresh. I know every couple months they get closer to that next age or fully in that next age. And and now you can say they're three and four, which just makes you sound like (laughs) you earned your stripes as two under two. Yeah. So (laughs) I love it. So today we're going to do a few things. We're going to talk about what we're reading lately. We're going to offer a couple of holiday book suggestions for kids, but um, just as a reminder, we did a full roundup of holiday picture books last year. There's a blog post. We will link that up. You can listen to us chat about that from last year and look at the blog post. And we, Katie and I were saying we stand by all of our recommendations from last year. Um, And then we're going to talk today about reading while traveling or reading on the road, both for ourselves and our kids. So Mm -hmm. I'm excited about this. Yeah. And it'll actually be a nice thing to talk about what our normal routine is. It'll be a natural thing to talk about, right? Like how is our natural routine different from our routine while traveling? Yes, totally. Um, And I am traveling for both Thanksgiving and Christmas this year. Are you guys going anywhere? Nope. We're staying put. We're staying here. And do you guys do like, like micro travel where you might spend a night or two, like an hour away, like that kind of thing? Yeah. Okay. We will do micro travel. Okay. Yeah. I just like that. that I like that label. (laughs) But you're still like, your kids are sleeping somewhere else for a night or two Mm -hmm. and bedtimes are a little bit different and yeah. Yeah. Um, awesome. 
Okay. So what have you been reading lately? Okay. So the book that I recently finished was actually a book club book and it was Girl Stop Apologizing by Rachel okay. Hollis. Yes. Yeah. So I did not read Girl Wash Your Face. And in fact, I had heard a very unfavorable review of Girl Wash Your Face on Instagram. Okay. And so that kind of soured my impression just of the book series, I mm-hmm. guess, in general. But because it was a book club book and it, ironically, it was actually my pick. And okay. how that happened was um, the library offered something called book club in a box. Ooh. Have you heard about this? No, but I, I think maybe a little bit, but I haven't looked into it. Okay. So book club in a box is exactly what it sounds like. It is literally 10 copies of the same title in like a Sterilite box that you check out the entire box. Okay. All 10 titles are checked out to you. And then it's best, obviously, if you have a hyper local book club. Sure. Because you're the one delivering the books or, you know, people are picking up the books. It's on you. (laughs) Exactly. And you're accountable for 10 copies. So I um, ended up doing the the book club with just some moms at my preschool, at my kids' preschool. And so I just distributed them at morning drop off and it was the easiest thing ever. So that was one of the titles available. I thought, oh, why not? I'll just try it. So I thought, of course, it has to be an empowering, inspirational book. And I will give it that, that it does cry the rally cry of go for your dreams. Don't let anything stop you. But just like the other moms felt in my book club, we all felt like it wasn't really written for the subset of moms that are not out there pursuing the same kind of thing that Rachel Hollis is right. pursuing. It's like a, a lady entrepreneur, like ball buster time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, and so she, uh, doesn't identify, especially not for really stay at home moms, uh-huh. which two out of the four of us are mostly stay at home. Mm-hmm. The other two of us work part time, mm-hmm. but she doesn't identify with stay at home moms. And she lives this life. Like one of, one of the things she shares in the book is I only fly first class. Oh, okay. <laughs> and she talks about her team of people that help her run her home, run her life, run her right. kid, you know, just very unrelatable right. to most yes. ordinary stay-at-home moms. So anyway, we were so-so uh-huh. on, on that book. Uh, and then the book I'm currently reading, I'm super excited about. It's okay. called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I don't know that one, I don't think. Okay. So it's your, um, I won't say that it's your standard habit forming, habit breaking book. Okay. Because it approaches uh, building good habits from the perspective of how you perceive yourself, like okay. um, your self concept okay. and your just beliefs about what kind of person you are feed into sure. the habits that you build I on a daily like, basis. Did you see Jill Krauss talk about this book? Do you I, follow Jill Krauss? I do, but yeah. I didn't see her. I actually heard about it from. Um, Laura, what is her name? Tremaine. Um, Tremaine. Okay. Yeah. I'm Laura glad Tremaine. I just picked the right Laura. We could have done that for a real <laughs> yeah, long time. From Laura Tremaine. And it's just a really good book. This guy, James Clear, he kind of backed his way into writing about habits uh-huh. from a personal experience. He has a remarkable story. He had a serious traumatic brain injury wow. from getting a baseball bat flung at his, the front of his <gasps> face. It was, it was an accident, obviously. Yeah. And in, and he was a super ambitious athlete, like probably would have gone on to the major leagues, had this horrific thing not happen to him. And in his road to recovery, he, um, began just honing in on habits. Okay. Anyway, then he, um, wrote this book and he calls it a user manual for changing your habits. So it's very tangible, very Yeah, concrete. I feel like that would be a great new year. Like put it on the library yes. checkout list now and read it between that Chris, between Christmas and New Year's. That yes. sounds like I would like to read that. And I'm 99.9% sure I saw Jill Krauss, um, post about the same. It's and super she's popular. not a big, like self-improvement business book person. So I yeah. know it was like a, like a purposefully chosen one. Yeah. That it's super, great. super popular right now. Okay. So what have you been reading? Well, not much. My second half of the year reading has been not great since summer. 
Um, but this is a fun story. So uh, publishers send Megan and me books all the time, unsolicited. You yeah. just get on, a, you get on a mailing list. And I think Megan's been on these mailing lists for longer than I have from her blogging days. But I think somehow my address landed on the list for the mom hour. So I don't think she receives as many okay. books, which is actually a good thing because we can't read them all. And a right. lot of times it's something we're not an interview podcast. As you know, these, the publishers want us to consider interviewing these people on our show. And it, it's just usually we're not gonna, and yeah. it's usually not something I'm going to read personally. So I don't think I've ever, sometimes I'll crack it open and be like, huh, okay, this looks interesting. But I, I honestly feel like it's kind of a waste of shipping. And I understand, <laughs> well, I understand the publicity process, but I yeah. also feel bad that it's landing with me who can't really help them in what they're trying to do is what right. I mean. Not yeah. like, a, like not wasted effort, but yeah. So this book got shipped to me. It's called For Small Creatures Such As We, Rituals for Finding Meaning in Our Unlikely World. And it's by Sasha Sagan, who is the daughter of Carl Sagan, who is like the world-renowned scientist, astrophysicist. He did, he wrote many, many books and did many things. But the um, television series in the 80s, Cosmos, which has been revamped now with Neil deGrasse Tyson and kind of got a second surge of popularity. Okay. Um, kind of making astrophysics like bringing it to the human level and getting people interested in it. Anyway, that was not a good job of explaining what her father, Carl Sagan did, but he was an insanely famous scientist. I am. She is about our, I think she's between your age and my age, just started becoming a parent and um, is raising her family secularly, but wanting to draw from all different kinds of cultures and meaning. Um, And backgrounds and beliefs. She calls herself culturally Jewish, but not observantly religiously Jewish and talks about wanting to draw from what we know about science and the universe and kind of like the magic and mystery of this scientific background that she has. And then how that relates to all different cultures and religions and how similar so many of them are in what we look for and what we celebrate ritually. So Things like coming of age rituals in different religions and cultures, um, celebrating light and darkness in different times, solstice. Um, And then she kind of uses that as just a jumping off point for thinking about rituals to start with your own family. So it's really well written. It's very accessible. Um, And I think whether you have a faith background or not, I find it so interesting to read about kind of the overlap in a lot of faiths and a lot of what is more where it came from. and how it's more similar than we might think. Yeah. So I do think it's written for people who maybe don't identify strongly with one particular faith, but I think you could enjoy it either way, uh-huh. especially if um, if you're interested in that cross-cultural stuff, which I always am. I'm always interested in like why we do the things we do and why we celebrate the way we do and how different people all over the world do it. That's just interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. Wow, that sounds interesting. So that is called For Small Creatures Such As We by Sasha Sagan. And then I um, have not read this book yet, but I pulled it off the shelf because my goal this year was to read more fiction. And um, it is called Less by Andrew Sean Greer. Have you read it? No, but it's have a you cute... seen it? No, nope, I haven't seen it. So it won the Pulitzer Prize. So oh. apparently <laughs> that's a thing. And it was a bestseller. Um, and the little quote on the front is from Ann Patchett. So it's obviously like <laughs> this is not an obscure title. Um, I've just heard Brian got it for me when we went to Hawaii in August, thinking it would be a good beach read. Um, and since we're going to continue this conversation talking about how we read on the road, I thought I'm going to just put it back at the top of my pile because it, I feel like it will be um, a compelling fiction read to finish out the year. So that is called Less by Andrew Sean Greer. And I, I can't I have no idea what it's about. Oh, I just okay. want to read so it. It's on deck. It's on deck. For next. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So what do we have to talk about in the way of holiday books other than to tell everybody to go check out our list from last year? Um, But I thought if we each have one or two titles that uh, maybe we didn't talk about last year that are uh, making it their way in. So what have you brought? Okay. well, I have two that are somewhat maybe very marginally related to the weather that Sarah and I have been having in Southern California. So, um, you know, we don't get any weather right. essentially, but yeah. it's been a little bit colder and it rained last night. So that's like yes. huge. I didn't for know Southern if you California. meant the weather from the last like 12 hours or for the last like month because <laughs> oh, right. it's been know. extra hot and like not even a fall in sight. And then just today and yesterday, it started cooling down. Exactly. Okay. So maybe these two books are the antithesis of Southern California weather yeah. because they both are about snow and winter landscape. So the first one is called Snow. Okay. And it's by Yuri Shulovitz. Okay. 
Yuri spelled U-R-I. And it's actually kind of funny because the characters throughout the book are really skeptical, skeptical about snow coming okay. and staying. And so it's like you see a bunch of cynical Southern Californians walking, right. Southern Californians walking down the road saying, well, the weather forecasters know nothing. It won't snow. It won't stay. It will melt. Uh-huh. And then it just keeps snowing and snowing and snowing awesome. and falling and falling. So, yeah, I mean, if if we in Southern California could get maybe a little rain, that would yes. be awesome. And then this other one is one that has been on my list for a couple years, but I didn't order it until the tail end of last Christmas season okay. and actually got it after the ended up getting it after the season. But um, it's called Pick a Pine Tree by Patricia Tote. Tote? Yeah. T-O-H-T. Uh-huh. And I hadn't gotten it the prior year, even though I tried because it was unavailable. Ooh. So it's one of those books that you really want to hop on it. Yeah. And if it's available, s- just snatch it up. So Pick a Pine Tree, I think, is a really great one just because it has beautiful illustrations. You see, like I said, a winter landscape on the front cover, and that is strung throughout the entire oh, book. Oh, yeah, great illustrations. And I think it would be a really fun one to kind of kick off the Christmas season mm-hmm. and also a great one to read maybe the day before or the day of you go and buy your tree. Get your tree. So it's just all about picking the perfect pine tree and decorating it. Just brings you through all the stages yeah. of a Christmas tree. I love that. That's I know when we've done our Halloween, one of my favorite Halloween books is just does the same thing with making a jack-o'-lantern, like picking out the pumpkin. It just like kind of explains to kids in this very, we've done it a million times, but they haven't. So right. I love books that kind of break down something that's so familiar yeah. into those steps. Yes. Um, I love that. Good picks. Okay. So the one I was going to bring up is Norman Rockwell's Christmas book. Which oh, is, um, I think I have it. Do you? I think Did you I grow do. up having it? No, but it was a hand-me-down from Kyle's grandma. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So I don't know when they put it out. It's a coffee table book. And yes. here's why I picked this. My kids are sort of moving out of picture book phases. Now, you know, you still come to my house and I still put all the picture books out and I, it's still a part of our, the way I decorate, but we're not just sitting and reading them as much anymore. Right. But my kids will sit and look through anything. They'll look through magazines, catalogs, so this is a coffee table book that I grew up with, um, and I love Norman Rockwell. I kind of forgot how much I love Norman Rockwell. And um, it is a, so I just ordered this Norman Rockwell Christmas book um, from Amazon today. I think my mom has a copy that's kind of like been chewed by dogs and stuff. So I definitely want one for myself. And it has all, it has his paintings that are Christmas related. So there's lots to look at. And then there are kind of story, my memory is that it's stories, poems, just little things to read. It's it's a coffee table book. So it's not yeah. narratively one story, but um, really cool paintings to look at and pretty to have out on your coffee table. So that's the one I just ordered and i um, excited to have around because I grew up with it around at my house. And as your kids are growing into that book, my kids haven't quite gotten there. So right. I too am unfamiliar with right. what is in it because we haven't quite gotten there. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. I could look at his paintings, just the the realism and the kind of nostalgia factor forever. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely a pretty accessory to have it on the table too. It's just cute and festive. And your kids are almost getting old enough not to just trash coffee table books when they're (laughs) like, you could have it out. They might not be into it, but they also might not wreck it. I just don't even have a coffee table. We're still in (laughs) soft corner ottomans, padded, uh, padded surface, padded object. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Okay. So let's finish up by talking about how we approach reading when we're traveling. So I was going to ask, Ask for you um, as an adult, yes. are you a big reader when you're traveling? Um, and then is there a certain kind of book you like to read when you're on the road? Okay. Well, it depends. It's really situational depending on the type of vacation. And I would say that I read most in an environment where it's conducive to reading. Sure. So we go um, to a cabin up in Tahoe every year. That's been like an annual mm-hmm. trip that we have always taken. And even in post motherhood with two little ones, I still manage to find time to read mm-hmm. because we don't have a boat up there. Of course there is the lake and we're out on the dock and we're playing on in mm-hmm. the sand and all that, but there's just, it's everything moves like 10 times slower. Yeah. So there are just pockets throughout that I can read. And as far as um, like poolside or beachside vacations, those just look so different in yeah. motherhood. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. So I'm not reading really poolside. Yeah. I'm doing other things. Um, 
And it just depends. I, I would say really that's it just depends. the type of vacation yeah. where I read is, yeah. is the cabin vacation. And as far as the type of books that I read, I'm still drawn to the same books that I am in normal, ordinary life. Mm-hmm. I don't think I pick specific titles. Yeah. Um, the really, I would say just generally the, the books that re- demand a little more thinking and attention and kind of more elaborate plots Mm -hmm. or books that are not so plot driven that take a little more work. Those I find that I read most successfully if I have, if they're like a book club book, honestly, like I need some accountability to really make that investment in working hard while reading. Well, I feel like you are someone who's very consistent about your reading anyway. So it would make sense that travel is sort of just follows the same. If you have a good book that you're into, then you're into it while you're traveling, which I think that's probably very admirable. It just means that reading is like an everyday part of your life, whether you're traveling or not. And then, and actually one other thing is that I read on the first like 15 minutes and last 15 minutes of any flight. I was going to ask if you read on airplanes. That's when you can't use electronic devices other than like, a yeah. Can you, is a Kindle considered an electronic? You can use those small ones the whole time now. The small ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I yeah. will like read a it's Kindle just or. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, my reading habits don't really change too much. Yeah. Um, I would say it, it for me, it also depends on where we're going. I need to, I need, when I pack, I need to purposefully bring a book that I'm in the middle of or very excited to start. Cause for me, as you guys know, my usual reading time in the morning is like built into my everyday routine. So during travel, that is harder. It's more likely that reading would slip off my daily routine while traveling than I would read more with a few exceptions. If I had a very long flight, I do like to read on flights, um, but I don't always. Sometimes I work, sometimes I sleep, you know. Yeah. Um, and then depending on what we're doing on vacation, um, I prefer it to be like a an not a Kindle, but an actual paperback, but not too heavy because then you're lugging something right. around. So probably something fiction or if it was nonfiction, something I was already into and knew that I could kind of keep keep the momentum up. But yeah, I'm not the best reader while traveling. So let's talk about the kids um, and and bedtime routine. I'll go first on this one because it is we're kind of phasing out of this, but We traveled a lot when my kids were babies, toddlers, and little kids. And we also traveled sometimes for, like, we'd go to Tahoe for, like, two or three weeks at a time and stay with my parents. Um, So, like, travel where we were there long enough to get into, like, a nightly routine. So that's kind of what I'm I'm recalling when I'm talking about these tips. Um, And I did try to keep bedtime reading a part of the regular routine and nap time when I still had nappers, you know. Um, And so just a few little things that helped me in those phases. Um, One of my favorite go-tos was Little Golden Books, just Mm -hmm. the shape of them. Now, the the titles and whatever theme you get into, like, it doesn't matter. I just mean the thin cardboard cover, golden spine. Mm -hmm. They can, you can fit those because they're so skinny. You can layer them in a suitcase between things. They're so light. They're also like $3. So if you lose them, doesn't matter. But they have relatively a lot of pages in there. And I've talked about this on the show before, but that's a great, a great one. And that was always our go-to. Another great one to pack was any kind of compilation. So those compilations, we have like the fancy Nancy five minute stories or whatever. They're heavier, but if we were, if it was going in a backpack or something, it's all we would need for the whole time. Cause it has like 20 stories in it. The variety. Yeah. So that was a good one. Um, let's see what else. So I, um, we use Epic, which is a sponsor of the show, of course. And Epic always is changing and adding their picture book, um, story availability. And we don't usually use electronic readers for bedtime stories. So when we do it on vacation, the kids feel like it's something extra special and they get to like digitally turn the pages. And and there's like, I mean, thousands and thousands and thousands of books to choose from. So that was another way to kind of mix it up, especially if like bedtime reluctance on the road, it feels like a little screen time at bedtime, which just feels like an indulgence, but really we're still, we're still finding a new book and, and reading together. So yeah. How about you? What is it like when you guys are on the road and, and how are you reading? Well, I have a quick question about your Epic routine on the road. Yeah. So does that delay bedtime then? Because there are thousands of options. Are no, they paralyzed I'm, by decisions? No, I'm still like in charge. I'm still, <laughs> okay. I'm still driving the bus. Like, it's just like when you say, okay, let's pick, you know, one or two or right. three stories. Yeah. Um, and like, last time we did Epic was this fall, we were in Chicago and it was so cute because Violet had remembered a story that she had read on Epic 
because usually if we're using Epic at home, it's more like a little bonus screen time. Yeah. So they're doing it on their own. And she was saying, um, this was in the fall, so it was before Halloween. She was like, I read this book. I really want to read it again. And it was like, I was having to take her description and then type in search terms. And uh-huh. we found it. We found oh. it. And then we were able to read it together. So um, yeah, no, I mean, it could go on forever, but I'm right. not going to just leave them with a device in their bed. So it's still like me. I'm still holding the power. Yeah. If my oh, kids can't choose a title, they're often as a 10 second countdown or I will right. choose. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. There you go. There right. you go. Oh, and then last one, I remembered one more tip. Um, and that is to, um, if you're going somewhere long term, there's no harm in checking out the local library where you are going. If you have someone, if you're visiting a friend or family member who has a library card, um, it's really fun to go to libraries in other cities or towns. I agree. Um, and Especially if, even, if it's a big city. Yeah. Or, and yeah, even if you're there fun. for four or five days, I, I mean, there would have been times in my life when the thought of keeping track of and returning library books while on vacation would have just been too much. So I, if you're in that phase, I totally get it. But I mean, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Libraries are free to go to. So it's, it's like an activity to go pick up books. And then if you're staying somewhere where, you know, your aunt doesn't mind dropping them off in the bin, once you go home again, I don't know. We've had a lot of fun with that. So Yeah. Okay. Well, my story is very similar to yours in terms of reading while on vacation, but I was thinking about the progression of how this has gone as they have grown up. And I realized that we've taken a couple of vacations recently and I've been less stringent and regimented about like getting in the book Mm -hmm. before every single sleep time. And I think that's because the kids have gotten older and they have adjusted and acclimated to new environments easier. And And that's totally the same with me. I was definitely drawing on the olden days for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it was so important in the baby and toddler days to maintain that daily cue and that sort of daily anchor of dedicated time because everything else in their hotel or sleep situation felt kind of like it was a bunch of upheaval. Right. Mm -hmm. So we, um, in normal life would always do a book before naps and bedtime, just like you guys. But now my, neither of my kids nap. And that's been the case. Luke stopped napping probably. He never he's slept. the three-year-old. He never slept like in his, his whole life. Your whole, I know. The whole time I've the known whole, you, he has never slept. His whole life. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so sorry. But, but I would still try. And yeah. so we would still read those books. Yeah. <laughs> but it still didn't work. Yeah. Um, now I've thrown my hands up. And then we progress to quiet time. Uh-huh. Which really means quiet for one child. Uh-huh. The other child is with me. Luke is uh-huh. with me at all times. And so then I, I would say, okay, well, quiet time is similar to nap time. Let's mark it with a yeah, book. I like that. Well, because quiet time has kind of devolved into what I really don't want it to be. It's kind of just like they go off. And you ignore or, them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we don't really mark it anymore. So now we're down to one book a night in, or one book per child yeah. in normal life. And on vacations, we pretty much keep it regular at bedtime. But, um, but like I said, we're a little bit less regimented. It, I'm a little more flexible and lenient on bedtimes on vacations Mm -hmm. now. And so if it's a really late bedtime, we'll skip the book or I will choose a very short book, one for two kids, you know? Um, So I don't know. It's just, it just really depends again. But one thing that I would recommend is if we're vacationing where we're in the car a lot, Uh um, I brought this it's called a me reader. Okay. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but I, I mean, they're in Barnes and Noble. Costco okay. carries them a lot. And essentially it's a library of books that are all uh, contained on this. It, it's not a digital screen. No, it looks like a toy. <laughs> yeah. Like it looks like, it, okay. It, it's one of those things where um, you push a button. Like I will do a little demonstration here. Yeah, you can push here. it. You yeah. can hold it up to the mic. So. Oh, okay. So I'm I'm pushing Disney Pixar. Finding Dory. Okay. Okay. So then it's interactive in that the child opens a separate book. Okay. So the reader itself has all the books within it. Um Yeah. And it's about the, the size of recording. Like, it's bigger than an iPhone, but smaller than an iPad mini, and it's plastic. It looks like a child's toy tablet or tablet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like a five by seven kind of. So um, anyway, the audio is contained in this e-reader, but then it comes with the eight books. Uh, So I just chose Finding Dory and we, the child opens the book and there's a colored shape Uh on top of each page and the same colored shape 
that corresponds yeah. on the e-reader. They push that and the e-reader will read that page. I like that. Do you remember the big like Disney and branded ones that were, it was all in one. So it was a book. And then on the side, it had those yes. plastic buttons. And yes. sometimes it would be to read aloud, but sometimes it would just be like, make the noises or whatever. Right. It's almost like they've taken the push button part away from that and put it in its own thing. Exactly. And then given you the books, which are smaller and more portable. Yes. So it's like can operate independently. Exactly. I like that. Yeah. I like that it's really, it's really very convenient. And I was a little skeptical and uh, apprehensive at first. Cause I'm like, you know, I just like the old school reading aloud, yeah. you know, I don't know how I feel about these e-readers. Um, but honestly, they're so great. And the kids really love them. They feel so empowered yeah. that they can do this themselves yeah. in their pre-reading yes. stages. So, I mean, my kids love them and they're great for the car. Yes. So I'm a person who actually, I forgot to mention that I do read in the car. Okay. And I don't get. So you can be in the front seat, passenger seat and just reading a novel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so occasionally I will read to them, but mm -hmm. that's less comfortable because I'm craning my neck yeah. and turning around. So I do that not often. Okay. But um, yeah, I mean, these are great car readers. And then I think. Sarah, you had, um, at least on the outline, talked about magazines on the oh, yes. road for I'm kids. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, yeah, so I'm wondering if your title of magazine is the same as the one I'm going to recommend. So, so, well, I, Highlights, is is that yours? Mm -mm. Okay, so I we have a lot of kids' magazines um, over the years that we've enjoyed. And again, I, I put them on the list so that, because they travel really well. The kids yeah. can tuck them in their backpacks. They're lightweight. If you lose them or rip them on the road, you could literally throw them away. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have a specific magazine choice, except that any child children's magazine, maybe you have a subscription and the kids haven't totally read through them. I've started to actually save seasonal. Like I saved the Halloween highlights from last year and put it with our Halloween books because they get it back out and they do the search and find and there's stories in there. There's little read yeah. aloud stories. So highlights was the one that came to mind, but um, just magazines in general. Yeah. That's one of the things I love about the kid magazine subscriptions is of course they always reflect the season yeah. and that's just so convenient because yeah. it's mailed to your house yeah. or, I mean, we, we peruse them at the local library, yeah. but um, the one I was going to recommend was for babies. It's called baby bug. Yeah. Is it cricket media? Yes. yes. I'm obsessed with the whole Sign me up for literally every cricket media magazine. My Same. older kids get the big, big kids ones. And they're like, it's like the New Yorker for kids. Yes, it's like, it really it's like is. smart kids media. It it's really like is. articles. And so we haven't gotten as much because I didn't discover all of these until a couple of years ago, but I just got the, what's the next one? Ladybug. Well, ladybug. Or, okay. I got yeah. that one for my niece. Okay. Keep talking. Oh, okay. I just got excited. Well, okay. So baby bug is zero to three. Mm -hmm. Although I mean, really I just discovered baby bug over the summer, checked out a bunch from the library and we took them on vacation because oh, they are great. tiny. I mean, okay. they are like four by four. Maybe. Okay. I mean, okay. Um, and I wish I would have discovered them when the kids were babies yeah. because, you know, you have recurring segments in the, yeah. in the little magazine. And then of course it reflects the seasons of the stories and the poems and all that. But then at the end, it talks about developmental milestones oh, that's great. for your child at such and such an age and activities you should be doing with them and how this enhances cognitive development and et cetera, et cetera. So good. Um, and then ladybug is for ages three to six spider. Is that what your kids have? Or do they have, no, so they have, nope, neither. Cause those are oh. all the story and literary. They have the science. Oh, and, the science. So one. we've okay. had ask, which is short for arts and science for kids. Okay. I would put that one. It's almost like yeah, it's well, it's arts and sciences. So it's yeah. both. And then we also have Cobblestone, which is a history magazine. Ooh, okay. And then Reed has Muse, M-U-S-E, which is maybe it's all science and tech. They're okay. all great. They're all amazing. And that's all cricket media. It's all cricket media and everything they put their hands on is amazing. And it I, is amazing. Please don't ever go out of business. I worry about those small publishing magazines. I know. I get their email newsletters and I'm like, I don't know, this doesn't look so good, guys. Like, So everybody go buy cricket magazines. And great, great gift idea. Oh my gosh, yes. And or they're family, not, this is your not a sponsor. Kids. They have no idea who I am. I just don't want those. I don't want those kind of companies to go out of business. They're so good. Yeah, it's great. Um, And as far as other tips, I don't think I have any other tips. But um, yeah, I mean, reading yeah. on the road, it's, it's a good thing. It is. Well, thing. it sounds like you guys have 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 done it and it yeah. just gets easier from here. Um, well, Katie, this was really fun. And I also have to say that we are just so grateful for you. It's Thanksgiving week. Oh. And so we're so grateful that you come on the show every couple of months and talk books. Our listeners love it. I know you know that from their Instagram comments. But thank you guys for 
loving Katie and loving this segment. It makes us want to do it. And so, yeah. This yeah. Was really thanks, guys. Fun. Happy Thanksgiving. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Go check the show notes for everything that Katie and I talked about, as well as Megan and I from earlier in the show. And also, um, I was going to say that this segment usually comes with its own blog post, like where we do a full roundup. And because we did it a little different today, there won't be a separate blog post, but we will put links to everything we talked about in the regular show notes for Perfect. episode Yeah, we mentioned a lot of books. Yeah, so, so that'll just be at themomhour.com and look for episode 236. Yeah, okay. Um, sounds good. Thanks, guys. Bye. Hey, everyone. Sarah here. Megan and I would absolutely love it if you hit pause right now, right where you're listening, and left the Mom Hour a rating and review. If our show has helped you feel a little more confident as a mom or a little less alone, that's one of the absolute biggest ways you can thank us. And it really takes about 30 seconds. If you're listening in Apple Podcasts, just navigate to the Mom Hours show listing. So not the episode you're listening to right now, but the kind of landing area for our show as a whole. And then scroll down to leave a rating or review. Thank you so much. The Mom Hour is brought to you by partners like The Essential Calendar. The Essential Calendar makes beautiful, minimalist, poster-sized calendars that show an entire season at a glance so you can see and plan for the big picture. If you're looking ahead to 2024 and have big plans you want to see all in one place, visit theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour. You'll save 10% off your purchase when you visit that link or use code themomhour at checkout. Again, that's 10% off our favorite seasonal calendars at theessentialcalendar.com slash themomhour.